so here we are. Okay, so um, uh, just make sure we're all uh, up to date on housekeeping. So the attendance screens are up to date. Um, homeworks one and two are graded and the solutions are posted. Homework three is kind of already graded as well. How did the quiz go? That, that, that time, uh, hopefully that was easy. You know, mine was, was bugged so bad. <laughs> I don't know what it was. Every time I would go to like submit the questions, I would go back. Like if I would get one wrong, was it Wi-Fi? No, it wasn't Wi-Fi. It was Wi-Fi was fine. I guess it was my computer. I don't know what it was, but every time I go on there, like hmm. it just I would put in this. I would take pictures of the questions I got, and then when I would submit it, did I get a zero out of twelve or a zero out of twenty? When before that, I got like an eighteen out of twenty. Same, same I don't know. I mean, I, I so all I know is I checked like the class as a whole, and I checked them like this morning. Just about like everybody had like twenties out of twenties. Oh, yeah, I so, persevered for like an hour. I finally got. It. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I don't know what happened. I mean, did anybody else have any glitches? Or that that might be a your laptop thing. I, you, it, it always is. It's just me. Okay. <laughs> it is. That's how it works. <laughs> um, I will post the solution to that quiz on Wednesday. Like it's actually already after it becomes visible on Wednesday. I usually like to post the solutions the next lecture after the, the ne next one later. Um, homework four is our next homework. It's going to be assigned today and it's due next Monday. Um, between this lecture and uh, Wednesday's lecture you'll certainly understand uh, how to do that. Um, we're going to be living in the land of angles uh, for the next little bit. Um, remember, surveying is a science focused on the measurement of what two quantities? Distances and angles. So it's, it's time we start talking about angles. Um, one other point, I did count everybody present for lecture eight. That was the one, the pre-recorded lecture on the total station. I counted everybody present, so everybody got a, a attendance point for that. Um, I'm still working on the labs. Uh, my goal was actually to grade the labs before the exams, but I, I messed up and I left the labs at, at, um, at the office. And so I had the tests with me and I said, well, I might as well just knock them out. And so I went ahead and knocked out the exam. So the exam is graded. Everybody's got your grade. Grades posted to the blackboard. So other than the labs, which I think I could definitely knock out by Wednesday, everything will be graded and up to date. So sound good? Okay. Like I said, it's always a sticking point with me. I want to make sure that everybody knows what their grade is at any point during the class. Uh, so the only thing that's outstanding are lab four and the lab exam, which I think I can knock those out by the end of the week. Okay. Um, so today, what we're going to do, oh, wrong one, we're going to talk about angles, azimuths, and bearings today. And that's going to be the topic today and the topic um, of Wednesday. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a lot of discussion today, and we'll, we'll start some examples. We might not finish them, but between today and Wednesday, we'll have all of the uh, examples sort of knocked out. So um, I want to set the stage for the next few lectures for the next couple weeks. Um, I would argue that the first main task of this class was the ability to perform a differential level. I think we all would agree with that, right? That, I mean, don't get me wrong, we had some discussion about statistics and distances and measurements and things like that, but when it got right down to it, I think everybody would agree that the star of the show in our last exam and for the last few weeks was running the leveling loop, right? That's our first main type of survey. Our second main type of survey is what's called a traverse, okay? So the way a traverse works is we start out with um, sort of a, a polygon or a, um, a series of points located on the Earth. Um, the idea is that one of those points we will know, uh, we'll either know or we'll be able to establish based off of uh, tying into various control points. And we'll talk about control points a little bit more detail in lab this week. Um, and the idea is to determine the coordinates and the, the locations of the remaining points, okay? A common example of when you would do this would be a property survey, okay? So how many of you have ever read a deed before? Have you ever seen a deed before? Don't worry, we're gonna look at one a little later. So a deed is a legal document that defines the um, constraints of a piece of land, uh, and it is usually defined as an interconnected polygon uh, property corners, right? And so the idea is that you would traverse around the corners of the land, um, and just like with a 
level, how we want that leveling loop to close to start at a certain elevation and end at that same elevation, we're going to want the traverse to start at a x comma y coordinate and end at that same x comma y coordinate. Um, I think we all don't need to be convinced of the fact that when we actually go and do a traverse in the real world, we're going to start at x comma y. Are we going to end at the exact same x comma y? No, there's going to need to be corrections that we need to do. So we're going to have to adjust those errors uh, in order to close that traverse. Okay. Now, one thing I'll mention is that whenever we're con uh, conducting a traverse, we're primarily usually only concerned with horizontal distances. So we're looking at it in plan view. So um, while um, we are going to, in lab, ensure that we're measuring vertical distances accurately, we're actually not really going to be concerned very much with vertical distances or slope distances when we do a traverse. We're just going to be concerned with horizontal distances. The reason I'm making everybody do the vertical distance stuff in lab for the next couple weeks is because we are going to need to have accurate understanding of vertical distances when we do the topo lab, when we uh, collect our topographic data. Okay. Now I want to um, take a step back and make sure that we're comfortable with the basics of angles. Um, we're going to need to start to get real comfortable in operating in degrees, minutes, seconds format. Um, and we're going to do a lot of computations with that, so I want to make sure that we're all comfortable with that. Okay. Now, um, before we get to that, though, I want to take a step back and make sure that we understand how angles are actually measured in the field. Okay. So we're going to talk about measuring angles, and we're going to talk about horizontal and vertical angles. Now, the big thing I want to make sure that we are aware of is that whenever we measure an angle, we need like three things, like three requirements. Okay. The first thing that we need is a reference. Okay. So, for example, if I'm standing right here and I want to measure an angle, the first thing I need is a starting reference. So let's say I'm standing right here and the reference is going to be like, I don't know, that line right there, that line that for that, that column right there. So I start with my instrument and I cite that, okay? And I say, okay, that's my reference or starting. The next thing I need is a direction of turning. In other words, am I going to measure this angle by turning to the left, or am I going to measure this angle by turning to the right? I'm talking about horizontal angles there. Um, the most common that we will perform uh, in, in land surveying and in our, uh, as well as our labs is turning to the right. Okay, So we'll start here, we'll turn to the right, and then we'll turn to our point in question. Let's say our point in question or our line in question is this line right here. So start, turn, end. Right? And however much I turn, however much that, 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 uh, that, that uh, the instrument is turned, that's the angle measurement uh, that I'm taking. Uh, you probably saw it that one lab when we were using the total station, but as you turned it, you could see the dial changing on that degrees, minutes, seconds uh, readout as you were turning. Well, we're going to start to measure that uh, in the field. Okay. Now, whenever we express angles uh, in uh, American land surveys, we are using degrees, minutes, seconds, okay? So one degree is 60 minutes, one minute is 60 seconds, okay? Um, and I want to make sure that we are crystal clear about how to perform those computations. Now, one of the things to keep in mind, um, whenever you're using your Casio, okay? So let's say I have the Casio here, okay? And let's just make up a number. Let's do 56 point, I don't know, 79 or 7842, whatever, right? And I press equals, okay? I enter that into the register. If you press this button right here, this is the degrees, minutes, seconds button, I can just press that button over and over and over again, and it will convert between a decimal format and a degrees, minutes, seconds format. So there shouldn't be really any excuse for not being able to compute in degrees, minutes, seconds because your calculator will just convert that on the fly. <coughs> and I'm showing you this on the Casio. There are other calculators that will do this conversion you know, just as easily. I am actually a really fan of the Casio in this class because there's literally a button right there on the keyboard to do it. If there's any one uh, class where the calculator really, or where this calculator um, really uh, demonstrates its value, uh, uh, it, it, it's this one, because it will perform those uh, conversions very easily. Um, I would also just make sure that everybody's on the same page, that uh, whenever you're doing your calculations in this class, make sure your calculator's in degree mode, okay? 
Uh, it's very easy to put a calculator in radian mode and then things are sort of messed up. So just put your calculator in degree mode. Um, okay. Now, whenever you're inputting data, um, what you need is you need to be able to, uh, let's do this. So whenever you're inputting an angle in degrees, minutes, seconds, so let's say it's 56 degrees, 23 minutes, okay? You can press enter, and there you go. If you forget that last symbol, the calculator will get angry. So if you do like 49 degrees, 56 minutes, 19 seconds, and you don't input that last degree symbol, that last symbol, calculator gets angry. So we'll say go to, put that in, and everything's good, uh, right in the world. You can express things in degrees, in degrees, minutes, in degrees, minutes, seconds. Okay, so just make sure that you uh, 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 include all of them. And so if you want to do calculations, you know, if you want to, let's say, add some angles, so we'll say this angle, let's add you know, 16 degrees, 23 minutes, 48 seconds, it'll just do it, right? And you can also just take it, say, let's just take that and add 180, or um, answer plus 180, just do 180 degrees, it'll do that too. We're going to be doing that a lot, so make sure that you're comfortable with that, okay? Any questions so far? Okay, okay, so I, I put a couple slides in here on how to actually do that uh, in the Casio, but it's, it's really easy. Okay, all right, let's talk about the types of angles that we measure uh, in the field, okay? And so I wanna take a note and discuss horizontal angles versus vertical angles. We are gonna spend the vast majority of the next few lectures talking about horizontal angles, so I'm only gonna very briefly mention vertical angles. Really the big thing about measuring vertical angles is you need to know what your reference is. So for example, if your reference is the horizontal, right, then if you were sighting purely horizontal, then your angle would be zero, right? And anything up would be a positive angle, anything downward would be a negative angle. Um, I don't, uh, most of the total station instruments that I've used don't really use the horizontal as a reference. They use the vertical as the reference. So you're sort of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, reading what's called a zenith angle. So the idea is that like this is zero, and then horizontal, that's 90 degrees, right? So 90 degrees, and then you've got less than or greater than uh, what have you. So whenever you're running your instrument, it's common that your vertical angle readout is reading something like 88 degrees or 92 degrees or, or something like that. that. That's why it's doing that, because it's treating zero as straight up. Again, I don't want to get too far into this because I don't. That's not really going to matter for angles, azimuths, and bearings, and for traverse computations. I just mention it just to make sure that um, we have that on the books for when we, when it does start mattering uh, a little later. Now, horizontal angles. Um, th this is what we're going to be focusing on. And like I said, um, there are sort of like two different ways of measuring a horizontal angle. We can measure an angle to the right or measure an angle to the left. I crossed out angles to the left because we just don't do that uh, very often in land surveying, okay? So the idea is that we sight our back sight, if you will, and in order to measure a foresight, we turn to the right. And so we have a consistent way of turning so that when we collect our data, whenever we look at that angle, we, we can sort of, sort of piece that together. We can take our notes and piece together the uh, the boundaries of the, the traverse that we're running. Now, we're not, this isn't gonna matter a whole lot right now, but I do want to mention the idea of a deflection angle, okay? So the idea is like, okay, if I have, let's say point A, point B, and I don't know, point C, right? So this is point A to B, this is point B to C. If you wanted to measure a deflection angle, uh, this is a, a new term, but a the way a deflection angle works, what I would do is take this segment AB, I would extend that line out, and the deflection angle would be from the extent to the line in question. The, the benefit of that definition is that geometrically a deflection angle will always be smaller than 180 degrees. This doesn't, I, I just want to be clear, this isn't really going to have much of an impact right now. Um, but we are going to see deflection angles a little bit later when we start discussing curves. When we start looking at horizontal curves, 
we are going to see uh, deflection angle show up there. And so I just want to throw the term out there when you see it, like, oh, okay, now, now I remember us discussing that. Okay. Okay. Um, before we start talking about angular computations, I want to take a second to talk about a meridian. Okay. So um, a meridian is a common reference that we use uh, whenever we're collecting angular measurements in the field. So a meridian is a reference line that, that we can base all of our measurements off of. Now, now theoretically, you can use any direction as a meridian, uh, uh, any direction or any line can be assumed to be a meridian. It's sort of like when you do a, a, a leveling loop, we can take any location and use it as a known benchmark and take a, a, a relative to, uh, uh, measurement to determine unknowns. Like when we did our leveling loops, we assumed that concrete pad was our known and our unknown was, you know, the fountain. Well, with a meridian, we'll take this direction as our known and then determine uh, azimuths, and bear, uh, azimuths based off of that. Um, now, the most common meridian, the most common reference that we use in land surveying is north, okay? So whenever we're conducting a survey, you know, we'll basically say that's our, our reference meridian. Um, and just to define what we mean when we say our geodetic meridian, our true meridian, when I say north and south, what I'm basically saying is that north-south reference line passes through the mean position of the north pole and the mean position of the south pole. So if you're looking at the earth, you know, sort of three-dimensionally, true meridians are not going to be parallel, like this line here and this line here isn't going to be parallel. But for the purposes of a plane survey, you know, we're not really going to have to account for the curvature of the Earth if we're just surveying bus per field, you know what I mean? So in most, you know, uh, reasonably scaled civil engineering applications, you don't need to uh, account for that. So I mean, you know, you do if you had a really, really big project, um, but again, just, just worth mentioning. Okay, so if we're looking at a, a line, okay, um, I want to make sure that whenever we're looking at a line segment, we recognize that there's actually two different directions of that line. We can have a forward direction and we can have a, a backwards direction. So usually whenever we conduct a traverse, um, because we're not dealing with any traverses in this class that'll have you know, more than 26 points, most of the traverse computations that we do in this class will be like four point traverses or maybe five point traverses. Um, we can get away with naming our points alphabetically. So we'll start at point A, go to point B, go to point C, and so on and so forth. Um, the forward direction would be in the direction, uh, uh, in the ordered direction of that traverse. So for example, from point A to B, what is that direction? If I go from A to B, I'm going, let's say, north, right? So if I go from B to C, what direction am I going? East, there we go, right? That's our forward direction, right? Now, similarly, we could also have that line could have a backwards direction, have a back direction, going the opposite way. So from C to B, what is that? And from B to A, it's... Okay. Um, and the reason I mention that is because we are going to need forward and back azimuths in order to compute, to do traverse computations. Um, and what is the relationship between a back azimuth and a forward azimuth? What's the, the if we're talking about like angular uh, uh, computations from the perspective of a circle, the difference between a forward azimuth and a back azimuth is plus or minus 180 degrees, right? And as we're going to see here in a little bit, if you have the forward bearing of a line and you want the back bearing, just switch the letters. And for that, I just want you to trust me on that. When we start doing some bearing computations, you'll see what I mean uh, here in a bit. All right, so far so good? Okay. All right. So um, what I want to do is I want to begin the discussion of azimuths and bearings. Now, um, in short, azimuths and bearings are two different ways to define the direction of a line. And some of you might be thinking, come on, Dr. Mike, why do we need two? Why can't we just use one? Wouldn't it be easier to just have one way to express direction? You are 100% right. However, the math doesn't work that way. The, the short definition I would give you is that bearings are what usually we're ultimately after because bearings are going to be referenced with respect to north, south, west, east. So whenever we um, 
uh, uh, are, are computing a traverse, bearings are the, the end result. But it is very difficult to do angular computations with bearings. And that's what azimuths are for. So azimuths will allow us the ability to do the math, right? Whereas bearings are what we're after at the end of the day. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's talk about an azimuth, okay? So an azimuth is a horizontal angle that is measured from any reference meridian, and unless I tell you otherwise, our reference meridian is north, okay? That's what we're gonna use as, as our reference meridian. So if we're talking about azimuths, north is zero degrees. East is 90, south is 180, west 270, okay? Whenever we're measuring an azimuth, right, we start at north, so here's our you know, coordinate system, here's north, and we turn that way. Why are we turning that way? Facing north, it's an angle to the right. So whenever you're looking at azimuths, the angle, the actual number, should be anywhere from zero degrees to, you know, I guess 359 degrees, 59 minutes, 59 seconds. Because once you rotate back over, you should be back where you started. So we never see any negative azimuths, and we never deal with any azimuths that are greater than 360. Because if I'm facing this way, and I turn 360 degrees, I go back to where I started, right? So it's possible whenever we're doing, whenever we're doing computations that will generate an azimuth that's bigger than 360, we just take 360 off of it because it doesn't mean anything. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's just make sure we're on the same page. So I've got here uh, an example here on the slide. So I've got my reference meridian north. Let's just make sure we're all paying attention. What's the azimuth of this line OA going to be? 70 degrees, right? Starting at north, we turn to 70, right? What about OB? What's the azimuth of this line going to be? Say it again. 145. There you go, right? We start here turn 70, turn 75 degrees, we get to 145. What about this one right here? 200. Say it again. 200. 200. And then this one right here? 350. 350. Not too bad, right? Pretty straightforward, right? Everybody okay with that? Okay. Any questions? All right. Okay. Now, what we were just looking at just now was direction one way. Okay, so let, let's go back to OA. So this OA, you said the azimuth was 70 degrees, right? So how would you determine the azimuth AO? Subtractor add 180. Subtractor add 180. Depends on the number, right? So if we're talking about this one, we would subtract 180. If we're talking about this one, we would add 180, right? Because again, we don't want azimuths to be negative and we don't want them to be bigger than 360. So a back azimuth is always, an azimuth always goes from one point to, like, you know, from O to A, the back azimuth goes from A to O, okay? And it's the opposite direction of that line. So whenever you're trying to determine a back azimuth, it's the forward azimuth plus or minus 180 degrees. And you'll see what I mean here in a bit when we start doing some computations. So if the forward azimuth is less than 180 degrees, you just add 180. So like this one. OA is 70 degrees, so AO, the back azimuth, you just add 180, so 70 plus 180 is 250. Make sense? Not too bad, right? So if the forward azimuth is more than 180, you just subtract. And, and I mention that because we're going to be computing a lot of forward and back azimuths uh, here in a bit, so we just kind of want to be proficient with that. All right. That's an azimuth. Yes, sir? No, no. No, no, no. So, like, are we going to have to, uh, when we get out for the lab and stuff, are you going to have us eventually shoot, like, intersection points to find, like, a certain spot? That's a great, that's a fantastic question. So, the, the question was, are we ever going to have to find, find points? Yeah, like, if you give us, like, a spot, and we got to go, uh, I don't know what maps you give us or whatever, because I'm used to, like, three coordinates and stuff. But if you get, like, two points and have to shoot an intersection and resection and all that. So, that's a great question. So, I, I'm going to give you two answers. So, the first answer is I have decided to totally revamp this week's lab. Um, last semester they did what's called a radial traverse, but I'm going to do something a little different this time. I'm going to do a resection. Now, the reason I'm doing a resection, so I'll level with you. 
Um, whenever you're in the lab, the math is much more intense. There's a lot of trig, inverse tangents, all that. But the reason I wanted to do the resection is because we can do it in the lab. There's no like taking the data, drawing it in CAD. We are going to do a, a lab like that. I can't avoid that with the Topo lab, but I wanted to develop a lab we could do in class, right? Um, so that's why we're doing a resection on Wednesday and Thursday. But to really answer your question, we are actually going to stake out points this semester for a particular lab, but instead of finding the points, you're going to compute where they are and find them. And the lab is laying out a curve. We're going to lay out a horizontal curve. So you're going to need to pin out the, the, the stakes for a horizontal curve. We'll do that. That'll be probably like late October, early November. We'll do that. It'll, it'll be later. So, But we are. So, so. To, to give you a little bit of a taste for what we're doing this week, I have actually four control nails in Buskirk Field where I know the coordinates. And we are going to use three of them to compute the location of the instrument and then shoot an unknown and determine the X and Y coordinates for that. That's what we're going to do this week. So the math is a little intense, but we can do it all in lab. So no take home. Sound good? Okay. Now, ultimately what we're after is a bearing. Okay. Now a bearing is is defined as as referencing our north, south, west, east uh, coordinate system. The actual angle itself, the actual number, the numerical value, is always an acute angle. So it's always from zero to 90 degrees. And I actually mentioned zero degrees and 90 degrees because I want to make a point about something. The first letter states where you uh, are measuring uh, the bearing from. The second letter is the direction you're measuring it to. Okay. So bearings are always starting with either north and south, and they're always ending with either west or east. So an example might be north 45 degrees east, south 45 degrees east, north 45 degrees west, south 45 degrees west. Now the thing with bearings is they can be either clockwise or counterclockwise. Um, because, again, we know that we're starting from north or south and we're ending west to east. So we can either turn this way or turn that way. So let's just make sure we're on the same page. How would we express this bearing? Like, how would we define it? What would we name that bearing? North 70 degrees east. North 70 east. Okay, somebody else, what about this one? South 35, 35 east. There you go. How about this one? Somebody else? North 45 West. North 45 West. Somebody else about this one? South 80 degrees West. There you go. South 80 degrees West, right? The angle is always less than um, is always less than 90. Does that make sense? So one question I always get is how do you actually describe this direction, right? Well, I guess there's two way or three ways to describe it. You could say north zero degrees east. You could say north, zero degrees west. Usually what I will just say, due north. I'll just say north. Because it doesn't really matter how much you're turning east or west because it's just north, right? So like, for example, what about this direction? Well, it could be north, 90 east. It could be south, 90 east. Or it could just be due east. Does that make sense? It could be any of those. Any of those would be right. Honestly, I think most land surveyors would just say due east or due north. Does that make sense? So, like, on your homework assignments and exams, what I'll tell you is if you were to put any three of those, I'll probably count it correct, although what most surveyors will do is just say due north, due east. So just to make sure that we're on, our, on the same page, so what's the difference between azimuths and bearings? So azimuths go from 0 degrees to 359, 59, 59. Um, the bearings, I say they can go from 0 to 90 because you could have scenarios like that, um, but the idea is that the angle is acute. Um, azimuths, you only need a number, you only need an angle, whereas bearings, you need two letters and an angle. Again, this is why it's easier to do computations on azimuths. Um, azimuths are only measured clockwise because we're collecting angles to the right in the field, and bearings are either clockwise or counterclockwise. Um, 
Azimuths are usually measured from north or from a reference meridian. Bearings are from either north or south. Okay. And one thing I want to mention right now, so uh, for example, if I have an azimuth of 68 degrees, 12 minutes, 42 seconds, you will probably see me write it sometimes as that. Why? Because it's just a little easier to write with the dashes. So if you see me write angles like this, that's, I'm just shorthand, I, I think it's faster to write it that way. You'll see a lot of field notes and surveyors just write with dashes. So. Make sense? Okay. Um, I have here this slide. If there's any one slide to you know, Instagram or whatnot, it would be this one. Because this one, what it, what it has in one clear picture, it has the, hey, here it is on how to convert from azimuths to bearings. Now, one thing for you math purists and those going back to the land of trigonometry, whenever we're in trig land, we start our angles, this is zero, and we turn them this way. In land surveying, it's sort of opposite. We start at north, and we turn like this. Okay, so what that means is later on when we compute latitudes and departures, our um, sines and cosines are going to be flipped. So to determine uh, x coordinates, we're going to use sines, and to determine y coordinates, we're going to use cosines because we're flipping the axis about which we measure it. So later on when you see that, you're like, shouldn't that be flipped? No, it, it's not a typo. So if you're in the first quadrant, which I'll call the northeast quadrant, the azimuth should be from 0 to 90. And if you want the bearing angle, it's just equal to the azimuth angle, north 70 degrees east. The azimuth is like this. So however much you're turning, that's the, um, that's the, the, the bearing angle. Okay? Um, for quadrant two, okay, this is southeast, right? So the azimuth should start at zero, go to 90. So any azimuth that is between 90 and 180 is going to be uh, uh, down here. And how do we determine the angle? Well, the angle is 180 minus the azimuth, because the azimuth starts here and goes down, but to determine south so much east, we start here and go that. So we do 180 minus that. Does that make sense? Okay, so, so with quadrant three, we just take the angle and subtract 180. So here's 180 minus the angle here, it's the angle minus 180. Uh, and then up here, it's 360 minus the angle. So again, there's a lot of info baked into this one picture. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So let's see if we can at least get some work started on our first real ex uh, set of examples. So first off, let's let's get our, our feet wet a little bit. So somebody help me out. What is the bearing of a line if its azimuth is 128, 1346? I want to see if you all can get this. And I'm not putting these in the class notebook because I've got some real examples that I'm going to put in the class notebook here in a bit. This one I'm just going to do on the board. So 128, 1346. So that's the azimuth. So how do I determine the angle? So first off, what quadrant is it going to be in? Two. Two, right? So it's going to be south something east, right? So how do I determine that angle? What do I do? 180 minus the angle. So what is... 180 minus 128, 13, 46. Say it again. 51, 46, 14. Do I have a second on that? Yeah. So south, 51, 46, 14. If you want to do this by hand, what you can do is instead of 180, what you can write is 179, 59, 60, because that, that, that is the same thing, right? And so 60 minus 46 is 14, 
59 minus 13 is 46, and 179 minus 28 is 51. So if you want to do it like that, you can do that too. All right. So yeah, that's 100% right. Everybody okay with that? So if you have the bearing of a line, how about this? So if you have the bearing of a line is north, 37, 13, we could say 0, 0 west if you want to put the zeros there. What's the azimuth? So what should the azimuth be? Should it be like what range should it be in? Like what quadrant are we in? So what so what number should it be between if it's in the fourth quadrant? 270 and put you're right, yeah. 270 and 360 or 270 and 359. So how would we determine that with this angle? 360 minus that. And what is what is 360 minus that? So we can do that. Does that make sense? It's not too bad, right? All right, does anybody have any questions on this? Pretty easy, right? And then this is why I love this. I mean, there's there's literally a button that'll do the conversions for you. All right, any questions? Okay. Now I want to start introducing you to some traverse computations. I've got three examples. We're not going to get through all three today. We might get through the first one. Okay? So I want to take a look at this picture right here. So I want, I want you all to watch with me up here. Okay? So I have here what I'm going to call a three-sided traverse. So let's say that there are three pins in the ground. Okay? So pin A, pin B, and pin C. I know the azimuth of one of the lines from A to B. I know that azimuth is about 120 degrees. And does that make sense from the image? Like from A to B, we're going down about like that. So that's quadrant two. So that's southeast, about 120 degrees. I want to know what the azimuths are of the other two lines. Now, one thing I know right offhand is I do know the interior angles of the triangle, right? I know that this is 60 degrees, this is 85 degrees, and this is 35 degrees. How would I know that? Well, I'd go out and measure it, right? So, now do those numbers make sense? What is 60 plus 85 plus 35? When I add those, what do I get? 180, and I should, right? And so that, that computation will become important here in a little bit uh, when we start having bigger traverses. But um, I want to see how we could conceptualize figuring out these azimuths, okay? I want to know the azimuth from B to C. Let's think about this. What should the number be from B to C? 35. 35, okay, now you, you, you're you probably right, but but let, let's take a step back. What quadrant is B, C in? So it should be from zero to 90, right? So let's see if we can be systematic about it. So here's A, B, C. That scale's kind of off. Let's, let's do a little better. Let's do that. That's a little better. All right. So I know that this is 120 degrees azimuth. But I want this, right? So let's think backwards. Okay? I want to face this way. How can I determine the direction this way? How do I determine this azimuth? This one right here. So you're plus minus 180. Plus minus 180, right? So let, let's, let's start checking this out, okay? This is my first example here, okay? This is my first example. Let, let's check this out. Let's see if we can figure this out. So I'm going to start with azimuth AB at 120 degrees. And what you're telling me is that if I add 180 degrees, what am I going to get? Azimuth BA, and how much is that? 300. Okay. 300. 
So now what I'm going to do is if I'm facing 3A, or sorry, facing, sorry, B, if I'm at B facing A, if I'm at B and I'm facing A, and I turn 85 degrees, won't I get BC? So how about I add angle B? That's 85 degrees. What is 300 plus 85? 385. I don't like any azimuths bigger than 360, so what do I do? Subtract 360. Yeah. So track 360. And so what's 380 plus 85 minus 360? 25. So I think you said 35 or earlier, right? So so we'll say we'll put a subtract 360 on that. So this is BC. Does that make sense? So see how I had this, I computed a back azimuth, added an angle. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to compute a back azimuth, add an angle. So let's add 180 degrees and get CB. What is CB? 205. Then I'm going to add angle C, which is 35 degrees. And what do I get? 240, and what is the name of that? CA. CA, right? So see, see the pattern, right? So I look this way, add 180 to do this, turn. Add 180, turn. So I'm CA, right? Now, watch this. Watch this. So, first off, technically this problem is done because the problem asks us to compute the azimuths of BC and CA. And I propose that the azimuth of BC is 25 degrees and the azimuth of CA is 240. Like I propose the problem is done. We, we actually can stop right now. But I want to keep going, okay? So here's why I want to keep going. Okay, I'm going to do it in a different color. I'm going to, uh, should I add or subtract 180 to get a back azimuth? And so what is this going to give me? 60. 60, and what's the name of that? Okay. So if I'm facing, if I'm at A facing C, and I add 60, what will I get? Say it again? Okay, so if I add angle A, what do I get? 120, and what's the name of that? We have... a means of doing a page check for our angles. So if we start our traverse and we compute interior angles, the azimuth that we start at and the azimuth that we end at, we should be at the same azimuth. Does that make sense? Now, this is a real easy example. This is easy. Like, I don't expect anybody to, to have a hard time doing the math in your head with this. But what about if you're on an exam and these are the azimuths. Like actually having a means of checking it, like we're going to start at zero, we should end at zero, right? So I want to I want to go through that process of doing that, that last um, uh, uh, angle to see if we start and end at the same place, okay? So I've got two more examples. We're going to do these uh, next time where we're starting to get a little bit more real with our calculations. Then we'll do a resection in lab today. Thursday. That's all I got, everybody. I will see you all Wednesday and Thursday. If you did not get your exam, come on up here, and I got it for you.